Preview cut of The Blues Brothers. Many don't know this, but the 1980 film The Blues Brothers was originally intended to be a roadside attraction, not a theatrical film. Before its release, however, the film was shown at the Pickwood Theater in West Los Angeles. After viewing this screening, the director, John Landis, was asked to make changes. The film was originally three hours long, with an intermission in the middle, though it would soon be shortened to two hours and 30 minutes. This version of the film became known as a preview cut, though never went to theaters and instead got shortened even more. Once in theaters, the film was 2 hours and 13 minutes long. The film, based on a series of old SNL sketches, was a success, helping further the careers of its stars, Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi. About a decade later in the early 1990s, John Landis set out to find the original roadside cut, but found out that Universal Studios had junked the original outtakes and negatives in 1985. Landis also found out that the preview cut was nowhere to be seen either, so he set out to find both versions of the movie. Both included deleted scenes with musical numbers, extended dialogue, and car chase sequences. The only cut scenes were available from theatrical trailers. It turns out that the preview cut was stolen back in 1980, before the Blues Brothers release. During its first test screening, the theater manager's son stole a print and hid it away for almost two decades. Then, sometime around the new millennium, he attempted to sell it on eBay. However, his plan was foiled, as both Universal and the FBI began investigating and confiscated the footage. While the preview cut has been found, the roadside cut is still missing to this day. Not a lot of people know that. This game show actually aired on public access TV, through Channel 31 in Melbourne, Australia. It was created in 2013 by Neil Sinclair, with Victoria Healy hosting it. In terms of game shows, it's pretty standard. Two teams, each of a celebrity and two civilians, compete head-to-head -head with various games. Six episodes were made and released, with them all being found on the YouTube channel of Emma Sharp, a producer for Not A Lot Of People Know That. However, at the beginning of the third episode, Neil makes this announcement. Now you may have noticed that some of the episodes look a bit different to some of the other episodes, and that's because somebody broke into our filming venue and stole the external hard drive with four of the episodes on. So we had to ask everyone to come back and refilm them. Now, that gravelly roustabout probably got 50 bucks, and that, uh, that's not much when you consider the effort that we put in. Now, everyone in community television works for free. The whole crew had to come back and film everything. The, all the guests had to come back and film everything. And so this is a big thanks to them for coming back and saying the same jokes twice, and filming the same jokes twice. Um, we hope you enjoy. Not a lot of people know that. Thank you. That's right, someone broke in and stole four unedited episodes. Kudos to them though for not giving up and managing to remake them. Due to the obscurity of this show, I don't think we'll ever find the originals, or even the identity of who stole them. In 2016, the YouTuber Sam's Movies made a video on the topic, with Neil giving him the following information afterwards. When I found out the hard drive had gone missing, I felt more pragmatic than anything else. It was gone, so we had to reshoot. It was just how it was. I think the reshoots came out better anyway. If the person had checked what was on their stolen hard drive, they would have seen hours of unedited panel show footage. Some of it very funny, but most of it quite dull. Much like Good News Week. I wanted to make something you would see when you got home drunk and say, What the hell was that? Something chaotic, led by a sense of fun, like the shows Tiz Was and The Big Breakfast. I don't know how close I got, not that close. Freaky Flickers, Quest for the Golden Flicker This film began production in 2005 as a TV show, though eventually it developed into a 90-minute film. The film was directed, written, and animated by one guy named Carrie Howe, who is based on a now-obscure toy line from the late 2000s of the same name, Freaky Flickers. The plot focused on Arg the Pirate and his crew of Flickers trying to pay off the debt of their creator, Doc Flick. Because they're pirates, this involves a quest to find the one and only Golden Flicker, Despite its low quality and budget of only $250,000, it was recommended to Kerry that he should make this a theatrical release. The studio, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, picked it up, deciding to release the film in over 2,800 theaters. Despite this demand, progress on the film was slow due to Kerry's limited software. To circumvent this, he hired more people to work on the film. One of those people was David Kahn, who helped with editing work. This help was greatly needed, as Kerry had a tendency to get tired while working on it too late. 
However, it seems that Carrie put too much trust in Khan. On June 8, 2009, after an exhausting night's work, I crawled off to bed around noon, leaving a now former friend, Dave Khan, editing in my living room. I awoke eight hours later to a silent empty house, Dave Khan, and all the equipment was gone, including the backup drives. While I was asleep, Peter Gatner, my partner on the film, and David Kahn took everything. I was deep in debt after throwing everything I had at finishing the film. I needed to move out of my house in a couple of weeks and was left with no option but to sell out my rights to Mr. Gatner for what was potentially one cent on the dollar. Now who's Peter Gatner? Peter and his brother David were the original creators of the Freaky Flickers toy line, who originally approved of Carrie making the film. Peter felt dissatisfied with the slow progress, so he had the hard drive stolen in order to finish the film himself. He hired new artists to work remotely, and reportedly even hired random people from Craigslist. The film never finished though, as Peter Gatner never gave out proper payments. This is an issue especially highlighted by Carrie Howe, with him stating, Currently I'm fighting a Mr. Gatner to get paid the crumbs I was forced to sell out for back in June. As of writing this, he's two payments behind, and every few days I get another promise to pay. I'm assuming somehow Mr. Khan is in the meantime being paid to direct my movie. The film has officially been cancelled at this point, with the only traces left of it being two trailers, a snippet of test footage, and a short made to promote recycling. Hi kids, I'm Doc Flick, and I'm here today with my friend Arg to talk to you about conserving energy. Conserving energy is the simplest way that everyone can help save the environment. The Merchant of Venice the legendary Orson Welles began working on this project while finishing up another film, The Deep, though just like The Deep, it went unreleased. The Merchant of Venice is based on a late 16th century play written by Shakespeare, telling the story of an anti-Semitic merchant named Antonio, who takes a loan from a Jewish man to help his friend. He ends up not being able to pay off the loan, so his friend's wife, Portia, must save him by cross-dressing as a male lawyer. It's a weird story, with some elements of comedy and more disturbing stuff, like Antonio being demanded to take a pound of his flesh off. Though if anybody can make it work, it'd be Orson Welles. The film starred Orson himself, Charles Gray, and Irina Maliva, being filmed in the late 60s in Italy and Yugoslavia. It was supposed to be a made-for-TV adaptation, airing as part of a 90-minute special called Orson's Bag. It was set to air in 1969, but was cancelled after CBS withdrew their funding. Apparently it was due to Orson's tax disputes at the time, so he decided to complete the project himself. He soon began screening the film, though the second and third work print reels were mysteriously stolen. This only left the original negatives, which were completely silent. No footage was public until 1995, when the documentary, Orson Welles, One Man Band, showed around four minutes worth of footage. Twenty years later in 2015, Stefan Roseller announced he was working on a reconstruction of the film, which would be 36 minutes long. This was done through the use of salvage footage, the original script, and the composer's notes. It premiered at the 72nd Venice International Film Festival on September 2015. There's parts of it online, but I can't seem to find the full thing. The original, All Dogs Go to Heaven. Released on the same day as The Little Mermaid, this animated film didn't do as well critically and financially due to comparisons. Part of that was due to the darker tone of All Dogs Go to Heaven. Directed by Don Bluth, the film follows Charlie, who gets backstabbed and killed by his ex-partner Carface. He ends up in heaven, and sneaks his way out to get revenge. Him and his pal Itchy devise a get-rich-quick scheme by using this little girl, Anne-Marie, but they end up growing a close connection with her. While many were critical of the darker elements at the time, the original version was even darker. Many cuts were made to keep it rated G, like in the scene where Charlie gets drunk and is killed by Carface. A shot is removed showing Charlie getting hit by the car, only showing the aftermath. When Charlie gets to heaven, he sings a song called Let Me Be Surprised, alongside an angel. One line was altered in the film to remove the word damn. Murdered in the prime of my life. That car face, I'll kill him. Murdered in the prime of my life. Damn that car face, I'll kill him. The Tommy gun was changed to a ray gun, and Carface's bomb was changed to the bar simply catching on fire. The biggest change was a scene involving Charlie's nightmare. He's seen falling into hell, being spooked by Charon, and taunted by the Hellhound. Many of the shots were cut, though you can find low-quality versions of them. In 
In the mid-1990s, Don Bluth planned on releasing a director's cut of All Dogs Go to Heaven. He was able to get one of the film's production companies, Goldcrest Films, to release it. However, someone stole Don's 35mm cut of the film. What's so surprising about that is that the cut was locked up in a storage room. At this point, that version of the film will never be found. Don's only hope at this point was to see if Goldcrest Films had potential copies. In an interview, Don said, No, the footage that was cut was discarded, not saved. The drawings were not archived. Goldcrest Film and Television actually refused to store the original art, and I believed most of the cells and backgrounds were destroyed or taken to the dump in the UK. They said that it cost them too much for adequate temperature and humidity controlled storage. In 2016, Tumblr user Steamrunner went to a summer art program where they met one of the film's animators. This animator showed the entire uncut hell sequence, though we don't have it in the highest quality. Green Day, Cigarettes and Valentines This was supposed to be Green Day's seventh studio album, meant to be a follow-up to their 2000 album, Warning. It faced many production issues, mainly stemming from lead band member Billy Joel Armstrong. He felt like the album wasn't as great as it could have been, especially due to pressure from the studio, since their last album didn't perform well. Then, in mid-2003, it was reported that the hard drive containing the master tracks to all 20 songs are stolen from their recording studio in Oakland, California. This claim was disputed by John Lucchese, the owner of said studio. He said, It was not taken from here. Everybody's fucking writing that was taken from here. It was not. I mean, they took their drives with them at the time. There was nothing that was ever stolen from here. Surveillance, safes, I mean, there's multiple steel doors that you would have to get through too. Many also speculate that Green Day stole it themselves, as the band clearly didn't like it. They even described it as a blessing in disguise, since what was left of the album eventually became American Idiot. In 2016, when asked about cigarettes and valentines, they mentioned the existence of rough mixes that were recovered. They were asked if that would ever be released if Green Day stating it was pretty much in the vault right now, mentioning no plans on releasing the full thing. We only know about the existence of five songs, that being Dropout, Waste Away, Sleepyhead, Too Much Too Soon, and the title song, Cigarettes and Valentines. We do have recordings of the latter two, but the rest are completely lost. The original, Food Fight. Food Fight is perhaps one of the most well-known pieces of stolen media, with its theft leading to the further development of one of the worst movies of all time. Our story begins in 1997, with Lawrence Kasanoff and Joshua Wexler working with their company Threshold Studios, and a Korean company named Natural Image. They were given a $50 million budget to make this CG animated film, managing to get some pretty impressive celebrities to voice the main characters. I mean, you had Hilary Duff, Wayne Brady, Eva Longoria, Christopher Lloyd, James Arnold Taylor, Ed Asner, Jeff Bennett, and the cokehead himself, Charlie Sheen. The plot follows various grocery mascots in a supermarket, who come to life when it closes. Dex's dog Tective and his pal Daredevil Dan must find Dex's missing girlfriend, Sunshine Goodness. This leads them to discover the sinister secrets of Brand X, the newest brand at the grocery store being headed by Lady X. This all eventually culminates in a massive food fight, as the title implies. The production of the film went well at first, with Threshold Studios bragging that this was going to make them the next Pixar. In late 2002, they released a trailer for the film. Yo, yo, sweet cake. This would be our only look at the original version, as in December, the film was stolen. Larry Kasanoff reported that computer drives containing all the film's files are taken in what he refers to as industrial espionage. However, taken in the fact that Larry has a shitty history, many believe the files were instead simply deleted. Instead of cancelling the film, Larry decided to keep pushing forward. It would now be released in 2005, not 2003, though not much progress was made by 2011. Its remaining assets were eventually given to the Fireman's Insurance Fund, who sent it to a random studio so it could be finished. It would eventually release in select theaters in 2012, to negative reviews. It just looks like utter shit, as if it was put back together using Elmer's glue. It looks unfinished, has creepy character designs, and even creepier sexual innuendos. Yo, sweet cakes! Oh, oh nice packaging! How about some chocolate frosting? Get 
I like the butt of your muffins. I want to scrub your bubble sticks. And with you on my back yet? Not that I mind that. I think I just wet myself. It feels rather nice. Oh. <laughs> In 2023, Lost Media Wiki user Tiffany Amber01 was able to get a hold of the original film's novelization. This version has a few different character designs, a different ending, and most of the sexual humor being cut. Besides that, we also have some original storyboards, concept art, and even a couple of reels. Even if this original film was released, it probably wouldn't have been any good. I mean, it's basically a product placement's the movie, with Chester Cheetah, Charlie the Tuna, and Mr. Clean making appearances. 